Good morning. Good morning to you all. My name is David Bogle. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at UCL, and this is uh, one of a series of uh, in the in the series Spring into STEM um, from uh, a number of departments in the engineering faculty. Um, told it's going to be about one a week <clears throat> from uh, six different departments. And from chemical engineering, uh, there are six. Um, talks that we're going to be um, going to be given giving. So uh, the session is being recorded, so you will get a, a link so that you can look back at the uh, recording uh, after after the event. And I'm uh, asked also to say to you that um, do questions. We you know got plenty of time for questions at the end, but I suggest you put your questions in the Q and A box just usually down at the bottom of the screen and put them in and we'll try and um, look at the uh, and I'll, I'll address as many questions as I as I as I can at the end. So with that, let me um, start my talk. Um, there it is. And I think, Mark, it is now showing, I hope. There we go. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, I'm David Bogle. I'm in the chemical engineering department. As it happens, I'm also the Pro Vice Provost of the Doctoral School at UCL. But I'm here as a chemical engineer and together with uh, Imperial College, we're part of something called the Sargent Center for Process Systems Engineering. Uh, and this is also uh, done under the auspices of something called COMPLEX, the Center for Mathematics and Physics in the Life Sciences and Experimental Biology at UCL. <clears throat> and as it says, I'm also the Scientific Vice President of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers at the moment, among various other roles. And I'm going to be talking to you today about chemical engineering in physiology and clinical medicine. Maybe a somewhat unexpected <coughs> title for a, uh, for a chemical engineer, but it's some talking about some work we've been doing here at UCL um, across uh, a, a number of departments, but I will uh, come back to that for hmm, more than 10 years, 10, 15 years. So if you know anything about chemical engineering, uh, this won't be a surprise, but this is the sort of thing that chemical engineers spend a lot of time looking at. This is a, a, a process flow diagram for an oil refinery. It takes crude oil at one side, does all sorts of chemical treating of uh, one sort or another. Um, uh, I won't go into any of the details and produces various products. So it produces what we all know as gasoline, as petrol, <clears throat> uh, but it also produces um, some, uh, let's just check that there's people in the chat. Let's see what's happening in the chat, make sure. Uh, Mark, if there's anything, if there are any issues in the chat that people can't hear or can't see, uh, I will keep going until you tell me otherwise. I can't see what the chat says, so voice is clear. Okay, great. Uh, let's get rid of that. <clears throat> So this is just going back to this is what, uh, as I say, chemical engineers spend a lot of time looking at. And we basically take raw materials and make a lot of products, usually some sort of physical or chemical process going on. <clears throat> so in, I often say it's a sort of engineering of chemicals in one sort or another. So here's another flow sheet. I think we'll advance. Come on, advance. Uh, it's stuck. There we go. So here's another flow sheet. It's a much simpler flow sheet than the one before. So we take a feed and we put it into a PFR. That's a plug flow reactor. It's a particular type of reactor. And you see it exchanges with the box above, which is a CSTR. That's a continuous stirred tank reactor. It's just another configuration of, of, of a large, uh, of a reactor of some sort or another. <clears throat> and then below it exchanges with another thing called a membrane reactor, which some reactions go on and it produces some sort of waste product out the bottom of the, the flow sheet. But the real process is taking this feed and through this slightly complicated set of cascaded reactors produces a product. And the, the objective of this flow sheet is to maintain the concentration of 
a product A within bounds, within the product stream, there's this concentration of A, component A. And there's a bit of chemistry, looks like quite simple chemistry if you're doing um, uh, chemistry A level, A goes to B and back to A again through a, what we, we, we might in chemistry call an isomerization reaction, but it's not quite that in this case. And it's catalyzed by a catalyst C going to the left and D going to the right. So it's, you know, what might look like a fairly simple bit of chemistry there. <clears throat> so why on earth am I showing you this, uh, this process flow diagram? Well, actually, this is the process flow diagram for the liver system. <clears throat> um, and it's all about regulating the, the concentration of glucose in the product. So we take glucose, we eat food, we digest it in the stomach, and it is reduced down through the acids, various things going on inside the, the, the stomach and the intestines into glucose and glucose is then fed into the bloodstream <clears throat> or oh, it's maintained in the bloodstream and it the blood uh, goes through the pancreas and through the liver and the liver is uh, um, a place where it produces some of the um, reduces toxins in the, in the in the in the system among other things but the whole point of this process is to try and maintain the concentration of glucose within bounds. So it, we don't want it to go too high and we don't want it to go too low. If it's, we have this, uh, um, the, 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 the uh, oh, I've forgotten the terms now, um, hyperglycemic and uh, uh, attacks if it, if, it, if it goes out of bounds. And of course, you will know that diseases of this process, there are many diseases, but one in particular, the most well-known is diabetes. If you're unable to control the glucose level of glucose in your in your system, uh, that means that the the, uh, the the body is unable to maintain glucose within the within the the safe bounds, and and uh, one has a hypoglycemic attack, and there are various medications associated with that. So. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a lot more about the, uh, the the liver system, but I just thought I'd show you the idea of of um, man as a as an industry, as a as a as a factory in some way, is not a new one. This is rather nice uh, um, image here from the 1930s in Germany. Der Mensch als Industriepalast, man as industry palast. It's a cute little three-minute video. Uh, from uh, from I think the video is 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 old, but anyway, it's um it's rather uh, neat. And if we've got time later on, I might show it to you. But um, just to show you, we take uh, through the mouth, we take food, and we munch up the food. And you see these crunchers going on there, and it brings in zauerstoff, which is oxygen, through the nose, down through the lungs, and then on the in the middle on the right hand side is something called liver, which is the liver. <clears throat> And you see these cute little bags of zucker, uh, sugar, being pushed down into the, uh, that's meant to be glucose, of course, uh, not quite right, but it's good enough. <clears throat> and there's cute little pictures of men crunching things out, reactions, little reactions going on and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, that is a bit of an inspiration, although I have to say I only find, found this relatively recently, this thing, and yet we've been working on this for quite a long time. But this is perhaps a more obvious process flow diagram for the human, uh, for, for, for people, for the human animal, <clears throat> where we take things, we've got feeds in through the nose and mouth, some solids, liquids, and vapors, passing through the system, um, through various unit, of what we in chemical engineering call unit operations, lungs, the heart, the liver, the stomach, uh, kidneys, and so on, and producing energy, but also producing some waste out through the bladder and, uh, and, um, and so on. <clears throat> so that is a sort of inspiration in a way for how we can think about the body as a chemical factory, and in particular, the liver, as what I like to call the liver as the body's chemical factory, because that's where a lot of quite sophisticated chemistry goes on. And here is more about the systems, broader systems and processes of life. This is a nice slide I got from uh, Tunde Oganaike from the University of Delaware, <coughs> who also works on these sorts of things. And we see lots of the, the life processes of humans have lots of systems, and these are the ones. 
the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the respiratory system, the reproductive system, and so on. They all have a chemical element to it and a transport element, but I'm particularly going to be talking about this digestive system down in the bottom uh, right. Uh, the, the digestive system uh, is taking nutrients and supplying them and creating energy for the rest of these life processes. But the reason I put this up is we as chemical engineers also look at process plant systems down the bottom there. We look at the process plant, the process, the oil refinery that I showed you that example in the middle. There are other so-called utilities, that's water, electricity, uh, heating utilities. There's, we have a, con a control system, the automatic control of, of process plants, a bit like autopilots on aeroplanes, rather similar um, principles, rather, obviously rather different technology and different power systems <clears throat> uh, involved. So we're used to, as chemical engineers, thinking about systems in this way. <clears throat> Uh, so I, that's how I'm now able to um, look at the digestive system in this case, and I know of other chemical engineers looking at the endocrine system, the respiratory system, um, uh, the reproductive system. The musculoskeletal system is perhaps less chemical, that's more a mechanical thing, whereas lots of these other ones you can see are uh, chemical systems. So. We, what, uh, before I get into the substance of it, the contributions of chemical engineers, chemical engineers, we talk a lot about analysis, design, simulation, operations of process plants. We design plants. We analyze the operations of oil refineries to make them uh, more environmental or more profitable or whatever it might be. <clears throat> uh, and the analysis is very similar here. Of course, we're using our chemical engineering uh, to in a, a understanding because these have got chemical reactions they have so-called transport phenomena fluids and molecules moving around they're complex systems and they cross multiple scales they're from molecular and even smaller than that genetics right up to the whole human condition in the same way that an oil refinery has molecules, uh, reactions going on, unit operations, and then the whole refinery. So there's this sort of multi-scale element. But then we have analysis. Well, in the chemical, in the, um, uh, we might be analyzing the process. Well, in, in the medical world, I would say the analysis there is diagnosis. When we're un trying to understand healthy and disease states, trying to make a diagnosis of what's going wrong and how we can improve it. Then we might design something and that would be to, to devise some sort of clinical outcome, disease, exercise, um, sorry, exercise, um, diet, drugs, of course, the med medicines. <clears throat> simulation, we use simulation to predict what might happen. And that's rather similar. We can predict that's what the medics tend to call prognosis. Although a medical colleague of mine told me that was a rather loose um, use of the t of the term, but uh, <coughs> it's good enough in general parlance that I think we're all talking about today. We're not uh, clinicians here. <coughs> and finally, operations: how you best manage the uh, the system, and that's managing disease and well-being in this case. <coughs> so that's the sort of broad way we can contribute. But uh, I'm what's called a process systems engineer. That's a part of chemical engineering. And we look at processes and we look at processes as systems. <clears throat> so uh, let me go more into the meat. I'm going to talk a bit about physiology in general as an engineering system. And then I'm really going to talk about the liver as an engineering system. <clears throat> and first talk a bit about liver function and use a rather nice metaphor that one of our postdocs came up with many years ago. We build models, we build predictive mathematical models to, um, to explore the behavior of these things. And then I'm going to use that model to uh, show you a bit about how it helps in enhance our understanding and enable us to predict one or two things. And then a bit about adding complexity to this rather complicated uh, system. <clears throat> and finally, I'll just talk a couple of general things about the chemicals, chemical engineers and role in what's often called the century of biology. 20th century was a century of physics. They say the 21st century is the century of biology. So what about physiology modeling? Well, uh, some years ago, it's 15 years ago. In fact, I was the uh, 
uh, led the uh, Chemical Engineering World Congress, chaired the, uh, the Congress overall. And one of the um, um, in speakers, one of the plenary speakers we got was Dennis Noble, who was a professor of physiology at Oxford, although he did his training and many years on the staff here at UCL. And he developed a computational model of the heart, and particularly the electrical and mechanical activity of the heart. And it, it really helped to understand cardiac arrhythmia. This is this un, uneven um, cardiac responses. And they did use his model for a, starting a little bit of uh, for drug design and testing. <clears throat> And so it was the first model. Obviously, it, it's not only the only thing used for these testing, but that was a, a, a quite a significant thing. And it was used indeed by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States for uh, looking at uh, drug design. And it had hundreds of equations and adult, adjunct models. <clears throat> So it was a very interesting inspiration, and indeed Dennis was uh, uh, an inspiration to us in our liver modeling and was on our advisory board for, 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 for many years. There are also many standalone models of specific phenomena in the body, how, how aspects of the heart might work, how aspects of um, insulin, the chemistry of insulin, for example. <clears throat> so there's lots of biologists doing little uh, small models of specific phenomena, how we might put these things together. And then there was a series of, of there were a couple of companies, Entelos and Sertara, which were doing uh, drug design using models, although the models were extremely simple. And this last two I uh, won't go into, but VPH is something called the Virtual Physiological Human, which was a large scale European project trying to begin the process of putting um, uh, models of, of different parts of human physiology together. So what can we bring as chemical engineers? What do we bring? <clears throat> and I'll try and get across how we've done this through the example I'm going to give you. So, but there are some key engineering concepts. I think you're all, or many of you are interested in studying engineering or maybe have studied or maybe are working in engineering. <clears throat> but this is the way we, we like to look at systems You've seen the sort of systems that, uh, uh, you know, the liver system, but that oil refinery system, and indeed a whole uh, company's system, and indeed sometimes whole economies. Uh, we're good at simplification. You can't model everything. There's no point in trying to model um, the quantum mechanics for doing distillation. That's not necessary. So we need to simple, simple models that still enable you to get uh, uh, to predict significant changes in behavior. Another concept we use is modularity, breaking system down into modules. And you've already seen that a little bit, how I broke down the, the oil refinery was a series of uh, modules, but the, the, the body is a system of modules, the, the, the heart, the lungs, the, the um, stomach, the liver, the pancreas, and so on. And we're also very good at doing a model and iterating between the model and experiment. So you. Uh, some people like to start with an experiment. I'm more of a modeler, and I think it's what the modeling helps to understand, and then you experiment to try and get the data and try and see how far you can push the model, what it can do and what it can't do, and then you refine and improve the model. And the last thing that we're very used to is engineering design is all about designing um, systems, but designing to a tolerance. So we might design, um, I know they designed bridges, for example, to allow a certain amount of give, uh, but only so much give. If it's too much, then it becomes unstable or becomes uh, unsafe, perhaps is a better way. <clears throat> so these are all concepts that we'll see uh, uh, appear in, 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 in what we're doing. So a little bit more about the liver then as a process system. This was from quite a long time ago now, but this was a front page of the, the um, the independent uh, uh, in 2005, and uh, it was a result of a, a very significant report about this growth of um, liver disease. And diabetes was one of the things that was really growing much faster than anything else. But the liver performs many functions. It performs, de it's one of its key functions is detoxifying. So we know that it processes alcohol, ethanol, for example. <laughs> it's one of the things that can be, can, uh, ethanol can actually damage the liver. Um, but it also does things like what's called bile synthesis. It 
takes out toxic byproducts and, and bile is a toxic waste which we then excrete. But we've concentrated particularly on this thing called glucose homeostasis. Glucose, so it's not keeping glucose constant, it's gl keeping glucose, broadly speaking, within upper and lower bounds. That's what it, it means, glucose homeostasis. <clears throat> And it's medically important because, of course, diabetes. But in fact, my colleagues at the Institute for Liver and Digestive Health at the um, uh, Royal Free Hospital, with whom I work uh, extensively, have looked a lot at something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD. <clears throat> and it's part of a series of, um, of uh, conditions that can affect the, um, the, the, the liver. So we've seen this diagram already. So uh, this was the uh, the, the, di the um, process flow diagram and uh, the um, um, wh why it's the uh, how it's is a model of. It's not a perfect representation, but it's a model of the liver uh, pancreas system. We're going to look at about at, at this in a little bit more detail, remembering that the um, the the objective was to maintain the concentration in the product within bounds, within upper and lower bounds. So we need to look a little bit more at that chemistry that I mentioned. <clears throat> but I'm going to use a, a metaphor here. I remember at the beginning I mentioned that I was going to use a metaphor, and this is a rather nice one that the, James came up with. So we have glucose, you see glucose in the middle. <clears throat> and you can think of glucose as your current account. It's the sort of money that you want to use on a regular basis. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, and you can draw it out very easily, put it back in again. It's very easy to, easy to use. But sometimes if you've got too much glucose, you don't want to have it hanging around in your current account. You want to, um, you want to make more use of it. So you can lock it into a savings account. Well, this, our body does something similar. It translates glucose into something called glycogen which it then stores within the within within the uh, the liver cells and if it's got too much glycogen within the liver cells it then excretes it as fat and that we might call a, a lock-in account where you know it's in you've got the money you've got it stored away but you've got to give it some months before you can uh, you can get it out again <clears throat> so those are that's a sort of storing of glucose if we've got too much of this stuff and of course you can take it out but it takes a while if you want to get it fat back to glycogen glycogen and glycogen into glucose is a little bit simpler likewise the easy exchange is it's more the sort of energy sources that's called atp and they're a bit like the notes easy you know it's ready to uh, lubricate, as it were, the, the, the functions, in this case, of the body. And the iron gradients are a little bit like the, 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 the loose change. And all of these things come into, into our model in some way or other. So we just thought this was a quite a nice way of thinking about the, um, the body, the um, processes. And here, then, we have the, um, the chemistry, that chemistry I showed you at the beginning, that glucose A goes to glycogen. Um, and that reaction is called glycogen synthesis, synthesizing glycogen, and it's enhanced by insulin and uh, depressed by glucagon. So insulin we've all heard of, but glucagon you probably haven't heard of. Insulin and glucagon are two hormones that the body produces, and they are produced in the pancreas, not in the liver. <clears throat> uh, but we can also take having stored the glucose as glycogen, we can get it out of the um, the uh, the savings account back to glucose by a, a reaction called glycogenolysis. And that the, the same two hormones work on that, but they work in the opposite way, not surprisingly. So although the chemistry, and there's lots of other much more common chemistry that goes on, we can do one hell of a lot with just this this basic uh, chemistry, although you'll see later on we've got a, got a bit more in. So here we've got um, a little bit more. We've got the uh, the bloodstream, the red down the side, and then the um, a blue uh, liver cell, so-called hepatocyte. <clears throat> and the what happens is that there's gl glucose in the bloodstream. If the pancreas notices a change in the glucose, it will produce glucagon that will be uh, received by the liver cell through these things called hormone receptors. Um, the glucagon will break down the glycogen. 
and then uh, transported back into into the bloodstream to try and keep the glucose system accurate. So glucagon there is the withdrawal or hungry hormone. If we need more glucose, <clears throat> um, it will convert glycogen glycogen to uh, to glucose, and it instructs the liver to turn glycogen into glucose. Whereas insulin is the other one, the full up hormone, and it pervades pro, uh, plays the reverse role. So this is the way that homeoglucose homeostasis works, more or less. <clears throat> and disease, diabetes is one of the diseases of this uh, problem where we, we for, for two particular reasons, type one and type two, type two diabetes, the body is unable to produce uh, enough insulin or in some cases, any insulin. So, I've sort of then talked about liver, of what they call liver systems biology, looking at the biology of a, as a system. But what's different to the liver, very different from the heart, is it's much more chemical. There's, there's a little bit of mechanical, but it's not near, no electrical signals like there was for the heart. Its liver is not isolated. It works together with the pancreas, as we'll see. And the cells work together. The cells join up and they communicate through things called gap junctions, not needed. And cells indeed, the so-called hepatocyte cells are not uniform across the liver, although our first model assumes that they are. And there's a wide variety of spatial, space scales and temporal time scales involved. Some things work very quickly, some things are much, are much slower. So in order to look at this, we developed a model and it was a composite model. It wasn't one single model. It was in fact seven connected models. <clears throat> and we did this uh, for quite good reasons in that um, the, the principle is because many people are doing models of little bits of phenomena around the world indeed, we wanted to have a system that was enabled us to draw models from different places and put them into uh, our model and, and drop them out, put a new one in without difficulty. So the model, the, the models, there are seven uh, here. And so for example, the glycogen receptor model, that's receiving the hormones that uh, translates glycogen to glucose through these receptors was built in a, a, a system called Mathematica, which some of you may have uh, used, a system that does mathematics. And it had lots of, it had, I think, five differential equations in that one. You will have done some differential equations, I think, um, with full enzyme kinetics for each protein. So quite a traditional model. And then we used a, this calcium model. We used something called X phase plane, which was just a public domain differential equation solving um, system. Anybody can download it for free. And there we didn't use the model that was published. We simplified it down to get what we needed from it. The glycogenolysis, which was one of those catalyst, catalyzed reactions, we used a fuzzy logic system, which um, I won't go into what that is, but it's it doesn't use equations. It's sort of high, medium, low sort of ideas involved in it. The pancreas model was about as simple as you can get, a so-called simple delay model. It's a single, single first order differential equation is all it is. And then there were various other models, the cyclic AMP, the blood and the insulin models. The insulin model in particular was rather more complicated. So we were able to put all these models together in a system that allowed them all to communicate with each other in this way, taking things from the blood into the pancreas, producing glucagon and insulin, the various, the uh, glucagon receptor model, the insulin model, and so on. And this is how the various models were connected together, passing information from one thing to the other. I don't think it's needed to go into details, but what we started to do then was to explore the behavior of this model. And actually this insulin here, model here that you can see on the right hand side, we particularly started to explore because we know that insulin can cause particular problems, particularly as we know with diabetes. So one of the particular parameters is so insulin scaling model, we adjusted this, this thing here with um, uh, the blue one we have, we got oscillatory behavior, these nice, neat oscillations. And actually, you think, oh, that's interesting. Would we expect that? As we'll see in a minute, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, and then as we reduced this parameter, 
this single parameter, um, we started to see these oscillations disappear until uh, when this particular parameter got to the value 0.2, it had uh, lost this sensitivity altogether. And we know that is what happens with diabetics, with acute diabetes. These um, oscillations occur. So what are these oscillations? Well, it turns out these are so-called ultradian oscillations. They're well known. You can see um, some experimental results here. <clears throat> and they, they uh, oscillate. And there are three types of oscillations in the liver cells response. There's what's called um, the forced oscillation that we eat once every eight hours or so, and that will force an oscillation. If you eat, you don't you don't eat continuously, at least I hope you don't eat continuously. We eat once every, you know, three times a day. So of course there's going to be a change in the in the glucose uh, as as we eat, it goes up and then it will come down again. There's very rapid so-called Brownian motion, very rapid oscillations going all the time. But these things here happen every two or three hours. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, as I say, this is well known. They're called ultra DN oscillations. We all have them, but they do for diabetics get significantly reduced. And here we see the red is some experimental results. The blue is our model tracking that, uh, that data. Now it's turned out that um, uh, most people expected these to be due to pancreas physiology, when in fact our model showed that it was a, a systems phenomenon. It was an interaction between the pancreas and the liver that created these oscillatory behaviors. So it just by doing this modeling helped us to understand better what was going on inside the body. So let me keep moving on um, and uh, tell you a little bit more about how we expanded the complexity of this, this model. When we look at the liver, well, it turns out you can see a picture of the liver here, that the, um, the blood comes up this blue channel on the, on the left, and it goes along the red channels, along the side of these liver, these little blobs that are liver cells, and the liver cells are all joined together. That's called a liver plate. And then the blood goes out the other side. So in fact, we assumed in that model I showed you before that all the cells were functioning in exactly the same way. Well, of course, that can't be the case because as it comes in, it's going to have be glucose rich. And as it leaves, it will be glucose, much uh, uh, less glucose and indeed less oxygen as it goes through the, uh, the thing. And the green bits is the so-called bile duct, the stuff, the waste products that go out. So we decided to explore that and um, one of my uh, research students, William, developed a, a model to try and explore, we can see here, um, the uh, compartmentalizing the liver into eight compartments along the liver plate. <clears throat> and each one of those compartments was uh, operating with slightly different, um, the, the chemistry and everything was the same, but the conditions were slightly different. Um, and uh, the rest of the model was, uh, was, was the same. So, but it enabled us to uh, look a little bit more detail at the chemistry. And I think we need to, at this stage, look a little bit more at the chemistry inside the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the cells. And here we see uh, quite a lot of chemistry uh, going on. And there are, uh, there's a few names. We've got this glycos, glycolysis and glucogen, gluconeogenesis. That's the one from glucose to glycogen there. Then we have triglyceride synthesis. What are these triglycerides? These are lipids. They're sort of, they're the, the beginnings of the fat that can appear uh, in the cells uh, that is the start of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Fatty is the thing. There. <clears throat> then we have some uh, fatty acids out there um, uh, that excrete the the cells excrete these fatty acids and it uh, appears as sort of eventually as little globules. And then the two ones that I am going to look at is this lipogenesis and beta oxidation. So what by building in all this chemistry and using the uh, the the um, um, uh, compartmentalized model. Um, uh, William was able to do a whole series of uh, experiments, but I'm just going to show you one of them, which was particularly looking at what happens when we do look at those two last ones, lipogenesis and beta oxidation, uh, by 
targeting by dr what drugs do is they target the chemistry, target the catalysis effect, the enzymes that catalyze those reactions. And in one case, we want to increase or decrease the, the two things going on. And what he looked at was what happens when you stimulate beta oxidation and inhibit lipogenesis. One of the great things when you have a model is you could do more than one thing at a time. That is more difficult to do within humans or certainly without very tightly regulated um, uh, conditions. So what you can see, you can see, I'm not going to go into the details, but there, some of them, it, there was very little difference. And when there's no treatment, that's the, um, the um, dark purple, you can see the uh, uh, lipid content goes up, which is, means that the, um, the lipids are starting to accumulate within the, uh, the, the liver cells, particularly down at the uh, uh, perivenous end. <clears throat> um, stimulated beta oxidation didn't make very much difference. You can see lipogenesis did make a lot of difference, but when we were able to do the two together, that's when we got the best uh, the best effects. Uh, so we're able to look at this. This is something you would never be able to measure because you can't really measure inside, take samples from inside the liver. Uh, uh, um, but here we're able to at least predict, provided we can have some some confidence in the model. And we, obviously we did a lot of model, model validation to show that it was um, producing uh, reasonable, reasonable results. So I'm gonna finish now, more or less. Um, you know, we've looked at, these are multi-scale engineering systems. That's what I'm trying to say. And this is something that we as chemical engineers have been doing for a long time. Uh, and this scale, the scales go from metabolism to cells, to organs, to, to the human. And we look at design, we have design variables. <coughs> Uh, to achieve design objectives. So in this case, the design variables are things like food, drugs, exercise, and potentially clinical intervention, although that would be very difficult for us to put into our models. <laughs> but the objectives then are health and well-being. And in this case, it was particularly the glucose level in the bloodstream. And we could look at other lipid levels and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what systems biology can give and is beginning to think about giving, let's say, to the world, uh, how we can look at personalized medicine, uh, taking into account the physiology and genetic profile of an individual, or at least a group of individuals. We can do in silico drug design and testing. And as I said, Dennis's model was used for that and uh, beginning to use some in silico, that means um, simulating model-based um, drug design and testing, and it can really help nutrition, health, and diet. And I believe we chemical engineers have a particular skill set to contribute to this. In fact, I don't think it'd be done without it because medicine has become so compartmentalized in lots of little sub-disciplines. And, but of course, we work in close partnership with our biomedical colleagues for formulating the problem, data generation, and how to, but we can really do the, uh, the solution bit. So just to uh, finish with some acknowledgements, and of course, you can see a huge range of people that are involved in this. A lot of the researchers at the beginning, but Anne Warner, who died some years ago in physiology, Liz Shepard, biochemistry, uh, Rob Seymour and Mass, uh, Anthony Finkelstein, computer science, and then various clinical colleagues, Rajiv and Nathan in the liver. I've also worked with the Cancer Institute and uh, my colleague, John Martin, who's a cardiovascular um, thing. So there's lots, I think, of chemical engineering work in these systems. Some contr contribution, of course, from chemical engineering. Tunde gave has been working on this. And we've got had money from the Research Council and the, the government and indeed Yunji, who, uh, Yunji, who's there, Yunji Liao, uh, was funded by the China Scholarship Council, and I'm pleased to say passed her PhD viva yesterday. So with that, I'm going to stop and see whether there are some questions. So let me have a look. And uh, I'll well, let's have a, let, before I stop the sharing, Let's see, uh, just in case I need to use the slide. So we have one. Within complex systems, you describe, there must be simplified and small interferences are effectively ignored. Is there a quantifiable calculator error margin to compensate for these small increments? Well, as I was trying to say, as I said at the beginning, we simplify. Uh, you can't include everything. Uh, there's a nice principle uh, called Occam's razor, which means to solve a problem, 
you take out everything that's extraneous, uh, leaving just enough to solve the problem and nothing more. Of course, that's the ideal. We never quite get to that uh, exact point or rarely get to that exact point. But the point being that we need to, you need to decide what the problem is you're trying to solve and then include all the phenomena that directly affect in a significant way uh, the effect that, uh, effect that you might have. So of course there are small influences small uh, increments of this, that, and the other going on at all the time, but they don't affect the basic um, um, behavioral traits that we're looking at. <clears throat> so for example, now we were able to explore those ultra DN oscillations just by using the, um, um, the uh, glucose chemistry that I showed you. There's lots of other chemistry going on, but it's not actually, or only in a very marginal way, affecting the effect of, uh, of glucose. What you can't do is the model will never predict exactly the right number, but it will tell you gross trends and will get you in the right sort of ballpark. And you think, well, that's not good enough, is it? Except of course, doctors take very approximate measurements when they are uh, taking a diagnosis. If you, well, you've all will have been to the doctor and you know, you'll take your blood pressure. If they ever take your blood pressure, you take your blood pressure three times in five minutes and you'll get different answers every time. Some uh, sampling systems are very inaccurate um, and certainly anything in, internal to the system is uh, always deeply inaccurate. Uh, so, so we're not looking for exact predictions here. We're looking for big trends, and that's what we're able to do. So let me. Um, these systems are all formatted in two dimensions, three dim dimensional modeling used. Um, it's not a, uh, um, uh, easier to map these systems upon three axes, axes but uh, perhaps it's a bit more difficult to visualize. It's not any more difficult to visualize, it's difficult to do, but it is doable. But you have to work out when is it really necessary? <laughs> Again, this Occam's razor point. When we model chemical engineering systems, so long plug flow reactors, for example, we only look at the, uh, the, the rarely do we look at the, uh, the radial, um, uh, well, we, we look at axial and radial, but, um, so there actually, yes, we are looking at uh, three, three dimensions there. But uh, for many systems, it's just not necessary because, for example, the chemical reactor is absolutely symmetric around the middle. So you know what's actually going to happen without doing that sort of modeling. In this case, I don't believe that three-dimensional modeling would add anything. Dennis did um, uh, do his heart model was a three-dimensional model, but there the heart with its, its um, expanding and contracting uh, and the different um, geometries, let's say, of the heart means that it, 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 isn't, it isn't a sphere, <laughs> it's a heart-shaped thing. <clears throat> the uh, liver cells are, uh, it's just a cell, so you don't really need to look at the three dimensions of a cell. There's a little bit of work on that, but that's really very difficult. Um, if you were trying to model the whole of the liver and try and explore, for example, um, when if you have too much paracetamol, the liver gets poisoned from the outside in. So that's where you do need to look at um, the, um, the, 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 uh, the three-dimensional side of things. But when we're just looking at this chemistry, it really wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't necessary. If you do add three-dimensional modeling, it adds a huge degree of complexity to it. They, they're no longer ordinary differential equations. They're what are called partial differential equations. Uh, and then the um, validation of those models just adds a huge extra complexity. You can model them, but are you getting it right? So that leads me nicely to the next question, which is, how was the model validated? Was there some data collected for this purpose? There certainly was uh, data collected. <clears throat> um, so some of the models we used from the literature, from people had published, but all of those models published in the literature would be, be were based on data from the laboratory. So I'm not going to go into all of those. Where we particularly um, were able to get some data um, was on uh, the calcium effects. 
So uh, I said before how difficult it was to measure uh, what's going inside the liver. You can see what comes out of the liver, what goes in and what goes out of the liver. You can take blood samples from there, but actually taking samples from inside a liver cell, whoa, that's really difficult. I'm, I'm, I would have said impossible. So the way things are done is people take liver cells uh, outside the body, they grow liver cells and they get them to do things in vitro, as it's called, in agar and in plates and in test tubes and things like that. And then you could do analysis and get uh, kinetic data, for example, of the chemistry from the um, from what's going in the cells. Is it the same as what's going on in the body? Probably more or less, but there's a there's a, there is still an assumption going on there. Um, so, but what they were able to do is um, particularly looking at these calcium uh, um, um, effects. What they did was uh, using rats, you can grow a rat, the rat liver, uh, the rat dies, you can then take samples, sliced samples through the liver to see what's actually happened to the, um, the uh, iron channels. Uh, but of course, what's happened is they've been, the, the rat is now dead, the liver is dead, and you have to take samples fairly quickly. Is it exactly the same? Well, it, it, there, there's, there, I'm, I'm no experimentalist, so I'm probably rather out of my uh, depth here. But the point was, we then validated it on some of those very detailed data, but also looking at some clinical data of uh, gross behavior of uh, patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And Yunji, who just um, defended her thesis yesterday, particularly added fructose to the uh, to the pathway, and she was doing some experiments with um, rats and with well, actually she she wasn't personally doing with rats using some other data that other people were using, and um, but she was doing some in vitro some experiments in uh, things. Now, love this talk, very enlightening. You raised an important point. Such work needs interdisciplinary coordination. How is UCL facilitating such interdisciplinary dialogue and problem solving? Well, I can answer that from specifically this case, but also from my broader role about um, um, as Pro Vice Provost, <clears throat> overseeing all early career researchers across all disciplines at UCL. And we have, I think actually UCL is a very good place for doing crossing disciplines in this way. We have a number of mechanisms. Let me first talk about this particular one. This was done through this thing called Complex, which was a, a doctoral training center still in, in place. Um, but we had a, a large number of uh, um, um, uh, grants for doctoral candidates uh, to look at various aspects of the interaction between mathematics and physics and experimental biology. So every project needed to have a, um, a modeling supervisor like me and a life science supervisor. So uh, Tom Sumner was the, one of those. Uh, he's now working at the School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine. So he was his first degree was in physics and I was uh, the supervisor and Liz Shepard from biochemistry was the uh, life sciences supervisor. Yunji and William Ashworth, the same. They, uh, I was the um, supervisor and from the liver digestive health was um, um, Nathan Davies with some other involvement. Nathan was the, uh, the main supervisor from there. So that's how, and Complex worked really well for that. I did some work with some people in, um, um, the Institute of Child Health on cancer networks, all sorts of uh, really interesting collaborations came up because they also had not just PhD projects, they had shorter little projects we were able to do as well. So that was one mechanism where UCL has these various doctoral training and, and research uh, places where master's students and doctoral students, you can have joint supervision. But we also have some things called early career, so domain networks. So UCL has eight domains. Obviously it's got lots of departments, a hundred departments, but there are eight domains which foster interdisciplinary work. So there's one on neuroscience, one on cancer, one on uh, collaborative social sciences, one on environment, can't remember the others now, and they facilitate uh, groups of researchers to come together to work at particular 
um, problems to, or at least to talk about, and then you need to go away and get some money to um, to support researchers to do things. We have a little bit of that. Uh, uh, the Each domain has an early career researcher network, which allows people from lots of different disciplines around lots of different departments, early career researchers to get together. So where they might not otherwise meet them, they can meet them in this these domain meetings, which talk about specific technical issues. They talk about careers issues, all sorts of other things. And then finally, um, we have uh, within the Office of Vice Provost uh, for Research, or it's called Research uh, Innovation and Global Engagement. Um, um, we have a series of grants for, uh, we have, there are a series of five grand challenges, and there's some money to support researchers and mostly early career researchers with small grants to explore uh, a grand challenge area. There's grand challenge on global health, there's grand challenge on um, sustainable cities. I can't remember all the five of them. There you go, that's a long story. <laughs> um, how do we balance the simplicity of the model with the accuracy and comprehensiveness? Or how do you, we know that the model is not grossly? Well, I think I've tried my best to explain that one already. It's how we, um, you know, it's as simple as possible uh, 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 and as complicated as necessary. And there we do that by looking, is it, is it able to solve the problem we want? And is it able to give the gross behavior that we're, 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 we're looking for? Um, I would like to ask if our courses will be converted to online teaching. Um, I think that is still under debate um, for this year. This last year, it was of course all online. Um, I think the autumn term, uh, the labs, uh, people have gone back into the labs now and the researchers labs are going, but they're under various socially distanced um, conditions. The laboratory work, likewise, we are now uh, doing uh, for the teaching. But at the moment, all the lectures are still online. I think it's still unclear what's going to happen in the autumn. Uh, I think it's likely that a lot of the very big teaching will still be online, <clears throat> but the smaller ones where we, because the problem with the, the very large ones is uh, they have the danger of being these sort of super spreader events. Not that we have chemical engineering actually aren't that large, but there's still, you know, people, too many people in a lecture theater. So until everybody is vaccinated <clears throat> and we've got this thing uh, more under control, I think the position may well be that bigger lectures will be online in the autumn and smaller uh, design classes, seminars, tutorial type things may well be personal. But I think that Mark may know uh, the answer better than that. I'll give him a chance in a minute. Let me keep going. Uh, what do you think is the next important thing in the field that I'm researching? Wow. <clears throat> That's a, uh, a big question. Um, if I talk about this area, um, obviously I am very driven along the liver system, but I believe that uh, in the medical, the, the, the medicine has become so compartmentalized. I've talked this long with my medical colleagues. They're really good at, you know, the cardiovascular system or the um, um, part of the brain function or urinary function or whatever it might be <clears throat> but it's quite difficult they become very special because there's so much to know about genetics epigenetics metabolism physiology anatomy all these sorts of things that they've sort of lost the ability to see the whole body <clears throat> uh and it, for a for a there's no way a, a, a um, gp can know everything about everything this is not possible so i believe that this model-based approach is going to be really important for helping to bring these things together in the same way that we've done that for manufacturing and for aerospace systems and jet engines and all these sorts of things <clears throat> so i think that's why i'm pushing this to some extent in in my role here we're writing a book about it i'm uh, editor of a, a journal chemical engineering science one of the executive editors we're doing a special issue in this i think this is a really important area for chemical engineering together with medicine <clears throat> generally systems engineering um uh, we look at some of these sort of applications in manufacturing in medicine in the environment whatever but we also have a lot of work on how to solve these problems um, can we solve partial differential equations um, 
efficiently, sufficiently, efficient, sufficiently well. There's a problem called global optimization, which is something I also work on. Because when we do find the best solution to something, we don't always find the truly best, we find the locally best. <laughs> so there are lots of interesting areas, but that's a sort of very mathematical end of things. But I think this medical area, and how we apply engineering systems methodology to medicine is really crucial and it it, it really will be it's the it's the, it's the way to in to enable systems medicine and personalized medicine ah. so uh completely different topic careers in chemical engineering how did you know what industry that you want to specialize any tips for university students to get jobs um so I don't think any of us know <laughs> to that level of detail what we want to do at that stage. I'm not sure that I really knew when I was um, sort of going in. I would say um, what you do is once you are studying chemical engineering, keep your eye open, go to some careers events, <clears throat> see what um, one you want to, uh, what one really takes your fancy. <laughs> um, because actually we have as chemical engineers we have skills that we can apply to the oil industry the pharmaceutical industry the um the uh, food industry the chemical industry of course the environmental industry let's call it that how to best advise on the uh, on the environment and maybe in, in the future in this in these medical areas so actually what you it's not really what industry i think what you will find is when you find a job that really takes your fancy that's the one you should go for. Uh, and I often say to um, new graduates, friends of my daughters, for example, um, you know, oh, you know, what if I choose the wrong one? Actually, the first two or three jobs, we don't have jobs for life anymore. Uh, I'm not sure that they were ever there, but they're certainly not there now. So the first two or three jobs are uh, finding out what you don't want to do. <laughs> So in my case, uh, my first, I did a PhD. My first job was in industry for a while. And that was really interesting. I worked in the gas industry, lots of interesting things going on. But after a few years, it wasn't that the gas industry didn't inspire me. It was just that it didn't, the, the particular place I was didn't, I, it wasn't allowing me to do the things that I wanted to do. And I wanted a little bit more freedom to work on more generic problems. So then I took a role as a lecturer in Australia, which, is actually where I grew up. It's a long story. Uh, and that was really interesting. And I went out there and I worked there for three years. And I decided in the end that I didn't want to stay there. Uh, but I really enjoyed being uh, an academic. So then I got a job at UCL. And uh, and I've been there, been here for 30 years. But even there, I was in chemical engineering. I've been doing this, this other um, job, wider job for UCL for 15 years now. So, you know, you can never tell where you're going to go. I would say five years is the longest you can plan. Just look around, take what takes your fancy. Um, can modeling be used as an alternative preclinical trials? I, I think we probably ought to wind up in a minute, but uh, I believe it will be. It it's can't yet, we're not there yet, we're some way to go yet, but I think this is the path in your lifetime, it will be used for things like this. Does liver function experiment link to synthetic biology? Um, it could do. Synthetic biology is how you create new biology, new metabolisms, new genetics to do something different. I think that's quite a long way off. I think we'd rather leave, just enhance the, the liver to do what it does naturally at this stage, but it may well be that um, that is in the future. Um, if the century, 21st century is a century of biology, what would be the 22nd century if I knew that? Uh, probably be worth a lot of money. I don't think I can answer that question, I'm afraid. Uh, can I still keep going, Mark? Um, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If, you, if you've got time. Can we expect to work on these physiological systems at other disciplinary projects as undergraduate students? Well, I offer um, research projects in the th third and fourth year and to master students on these things. We haven't yet got them embedded within the core curriculum. I think my colleague Vivek might put them in one of his systems, but that's, I think there might be in the next few years as we can build them into, so chemical reaction engineering could have some elements of, of medicine in there. I know that um, 
Scott Fogler, at the University of Michigan, wrote the great, the, the most commonly used uh, chemical reactioneering textbook in the world. I think he's got 90% of the market. He uses some medical things in his textbook. So, uh, uh, but I'm not sure whether we do within our um, uh, reaction engineering course. Um, within systems, we could start to look at simplified uh, medical, medical, medical systems. So it's coming, it's not there yet. Uh, and that's partly because we don't quite have the, uh, the textbooks and all the materials for it yet. Do you think that in the near future, the boundary between the field of medicine and engineering will get blurred? Absolutely. The field medicine and engineering, it's already a little bit blurred. We have a, um, um, a department called um, uh, medical physics and bioengineering. So there's a thing called bioengineering. Bioengineering has means lots of different things. That's the only problem. In some case, it could be synthetic biology that somebody talked about how you um, um, modify biology to uh, imaging to biotechnology. These are very, very uh, different things. But I do believe that um, the, the things between medicine and engineering will change. Medicine is will is becoming more quantitative and more predictive <laughs> but it's it's going to be a while before it it affects um, you know comprehensively uh, medicine because we still we don't yet have the accuracy i've shown you um, that it can explain gross behavior <clears throat> um, and there are different modeling systems looking at different bits of uh, human physiology. And as we start to put all these things together, it will be there, it certainly will be there in your lifetime. Um, I'm not sure about the, the, the near future. Yeah, I mean, I think that boundary is being blurred already, I think is the answer. Uh, among all organ systems, why did you choose glucose homeostasis? Right, uh, maybe this is the last uh, question, perhaps, or oh, well, no, there's another one more. Um, so that was a long um, story, it goes back to early 2000s, perhaps maybe mid 2000s, when I was working with Anne Warner, who was a professor of um, uh, anatomy. Uh, and um, a number of us got together to look at this system, how, and it, it was, we wanted to look at systems. Mm. Dennis had been looking at the heart. There was a funding opportunity um, through the, the Department of Trade and Industry harnessing, harnessing genomics. So we put this idea at how we might be able to, the project was called Vertical Integration of Biological Scales. And we talked about quite a lot of systems, but we decided in the end that the liver was central to the body. Uh, it was a chemical system, so distinct from the, the heart system, which was more mechanical and electrical. And it, we believed that it was uh, a... Um, a modelable system uh, in the way that I've described. Um, we shied clear of the brain, which we think is um, too difficult. <laughs> uh, although there's a lot of people doing really good um, um, work on the brain, but I think that's, you know, in a sense, the final frontier because it's this, all these strange electrical signals as well as the, the um, um, geography of the brain and all sorts of things. Whereas the, body, the liver has these basic chemical functions and there's some physics and uh, um, physics and chemistry going on in there. So we believed it. And so that's why we chose the, the liver system and glucose homeostasis. And of course, because it's clear link to disease, diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and a number of other ones. Um, I'm a biomedical science student who joined the talk out of curiosity. Multidisciplinary research sounds exciting. Do you have any advice or what I might need? other than a biomedical science degree to work in discipline and multidisciplinary research. So there is within the biomedical sciences um, um, stream here at UCL, uh, Benny Chain runs a, a, a module called modeling in medicine. And in fact, I give some of this to that course, <laughs> um, a little bit more detail, but he has other people from lots of other bits of, of UCL. So uh, I think a biomedical science uh, degree sets you up for that. The way to do it is then to choose a range of modules uh, and particularly try and choose a project, uh, a research project when you get into the uh, research project that does indeed cross disciplines. 
and particularly using mathematical modeling, <clears throat> um, uh, which I think is key to enabling these things. You could look at the uh, crossing disciplines between medical disciplines, but I think you want to get to try and look at biomedical sciences from outside, from maths, from computer science, from maybe from physics, from maybe even from the social sciences as, as, as well, because we haven't talked about that at all. So it's all about the choice of modules, uh, some of which will be more multidisciplinary than the other, but I, don't, I can't remember how much choice there is in there, and the choice of project, the projects that you do, and indeed within some of the modules you might have some uh, choices. Okay, with that, thank you all very much for listening. <laughs> And I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, some nice, some very nice uh, questions there. And um, over to you, Mark. Do you want to say any more? Um, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that session. I think it was very interesting. Um, if you um, do have any questions, do get in touch with the department. You can email chemeng.webinars at ucl.ac.uk and uh, we will answer those. Also, you will receive um, the recording uh, via Zoom and it will be available on YouTube. And uh, if you would um, like to uh, provide some feedback, you will receive a, um, a link to a feedback form that you can fill out to, um, yeah, just uh, your thoughts and feelings about the webinar today. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to close the session and um, thank you again for joining. Bye everyone. Bye.